So welcome everyone to the AI Innovation Spotlight session, a special edition of the EU Startups podcast, which is conducted today as part of the EU project Innovation Radar Bridge. This project is a collaboration between EU startups, DealRoom and DealFlow, um, and the goal is to strengthen the connections between innovators, investors and policymakers, and to, uh, um, to lead to an uptake in EU-funded innovations and their market potential. Today, we're here with six, six super exciting AI-focused um, deep tech founders and with four VCs. Um, and we will have a pitch session, uh, which is going to start in a few moments. Um, for all founders that are listening to us today, uh, I will also um, want to uh, um, mention the discover.dealflow EU platform, uh, which is a platform connecting startups with investors and where startups can upload their pitch decks, share fundraising details, and therefore get discovered more easily. If you haven't heard about this platform before, definitely check it out. And yeah, as I said before, in a few moments, we're going to start off with the pitches. Founders will present their technology and businesses uh, within five minute pitches. And shortly afterwards, we'll have uh, rounds of three minute Q&A sessions with the VC panel. Uh, but before kicking this off, uh, let's start with a quick round of introductions regarding the participating investors. So uh, let's start with Anna Bosch from B2 Ventures. Anna, do you want to introduce yourself for one or two minutes? Yes, so hi everyone, I'm Anna, I'm an investor at B2Venture based in Berlin. We are an early stage venture capital fund focused on pre-seed and seed investments ac uh, across Europe. have a quiet industry agnostic investment approach, but a strong focus on AI-enabled business models. Uh, some of our portfolio companies, for example, include DeepL, Data Artisan, Raisin and SumUp, and we are very happy to be here. Awesome, thank you so much for joining us. And next will be Angelo from Look AI Ventures. Hey there, thanks for having us. I'm one of the partners at uh, Look AI Ventures. My name is Angelo Burcarello, and we are based in Czech Republic. Uh, Look AI Ventures is the, um, the first venture capital uh, in Czech Republic that is exclusively focused uh, in, in AI businesses. And uh, we look for startups that have AI at their core, um, and also have developed something um, exclusive and uh, unique in terms of uh, technology. Uh, that's why we only evaluate startups that have already an MVP or a prototype ready, and we are able to invest in pre-seed and seed stage startups. We define ourselves as uh, industry agnostic because we focus on the AI technology, and uh, uh, we are also geography agnostic while focusing on Europe overall. Uh, our ticket size is 250k, uh, like, a, like a first ticket, but we can also follow up with tickets up to 1 million. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Angelo. And next will be John Clark from P2. Hi, everyone. I'm John. Uh, I'm a founding partner, one of two at P2 Capital, based in Dublin, Ireland. We are a new venture finance firm that will be announcing our fundraise in the coming weeks. We're focused on B2B SaaS uh, with an element of data and AI that are looking to scale internationally, predominantly into North America and using Canada as a strategic platform to achieve that, uh, as well as Asia and looking at Singapore as a strategic platform to achieve that. Um, my background, I'm an AI fanatic. Uh, I'm chairperson of Spark, which is a Dublin headquartered uh, but pan-European data and AI uh, consultancy and engineering firm. So I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say about their ventures today. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for being with us, John. And last but not least, uh, Guy from dealflow.eu. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Happy to be here. Um, I'm actually representing Ventures.eu in this case, as well as Dilfer.eu, uh, and, and happy to be here. It's two organizations that, of course, work together. Um, Ventures.eu is a fund that will be based out of Lisbon, Portugal, um, investing across Portugal. About 50% of its deployment will be there, 40% to 50% across Europe. Uh, Pan-European, that's where, of course, uh, all the deal flow comes from, uh, strong backing from the EU, and that's something that we are close to. Uh, we'll be focusing rather sector agnostically. However, um, similarly to Anna Bosch, actually, AI is quite central to our attention, and we do have a lot of energy geared towards AI. So particularly thrilled to be happening and to be listening to all your ventures today. Um, I'll point out as well that our ticket ranges go from 0 0.2 
to 2 million, uh, looking at seed, Series A, and opportunistic Series B as well. Um, once again, thrilled to be here, and thank you for having us. Awesome. Thanks so much, Guy, for being with us. And uh, with that, we're going to hand over to the founders and to today's presentations. So the first um, founder will be the CEO of Sinfo, uh, Antonio Del Coral. Antonio, the stage is yours. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I, I am uh, Antonio Del Corral, the CEO of Sinfo. Well, happy to be here presenting you uh, TVs, our product, our automated TV production platform. Well, the original need that raised our desire to create a new product is this one, 95% of sport and also cultural events are never streamed alive. Why that? Because for, well, small uh, teams, for small federations, for small leagues, uh, to take two, three people to, to the venue and produce a match is, is too much of a cost for the business they can generate. And this creates uh, only in Europe thousands of full leagues that remain streamed. And the issue is that uh, when you bring this idea to sponsors, they do not want a basic streaming production with cameras going from left to right, but they want a full uh, quality production if they want to, if they are to attach their brands to it. So the, the, the problem is this one, to create a low cost production system that produces enough quality to attain sponsors. Well, uh, and this is happening, AI uh, creating a technology uh, of sports is approaching slowly uh, the standards of TV sport quality in terms of cameras being used, cloud capacities, the AI itself, the automation you can create, and even of speakers created by, by AI. And this will generate a blue sound of, cont of content that is ready to be monetized. And in our experience, it's quite easy to, to monetize. And this, we think, is the moment to enter this market. Our solution is composed of three elements. Then we have, as a, the first one, the capture element, where we deploy cameras in a venue. Those cameras remain the whole season fixed installing the venue, producing continually matches of all the teams playing on that venue. Uh, the camera send the video to our AI. On, on, on our cloud uh, platform, we have several elements. The most important of it is the cloud mixer, which is where we create the production and we send the video to our OTT platform. Our AI is quite unique. It's able to move several cameras at once. It's able to select which camera in each moment is best for, for production. It's introducing advertising on its own. It speaks. Uh, it's starting to speak now. It's that we are starting to deploy our AI-powered narrator for sports, and we also provide inside the system an integrated 3D environment for advertising to create fancy advertisement, advertisement for, for sponsors. Uh, this is our studio system, and in this studio system, residing in the cloud, humans can collaborate with the AI to create full productions, even with interviews to players or to coaches or to panels after the session. Everything is managed on the cloud. And with our system, you can go from basic production with AI uh, only to a full uh, uh, match of second division with several speakers on time, plus the AI, plus the interviews. And we send everything to a wide level OTT sport platform. So a sports federation, right honors from us, they can get from the production system to the OTT app all together integrated and functioning in an automated manner. Well, our model currently for regions is one. We get the rights from the sport federations, we deploy the hardware, we publish the apps, we run the platform, we partner with the sponsors. We have four levels of sponsorships from 50,000 per year to 120 euros per year, and we share profits with the sports. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, um, I think we're going to move to the next one. So, um, Antonio, you can stop uh, sharing your screen. Um, the next presenter um, will be Frederick from Exacure. Frederick, the stage Hi, is Matt. yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen. All right. I think you see my screen. So hi, everyone. That's a real pleasure to be here with you today. 
We're going to talk about Exact Cure, my company. We're going to talk about digital twins and personalized medication, personalized medicine. So totally different field. Uh, the, the, the starting point of Exact Cure is medication. Uh, we truly believe at Exact Cure that medication is maybe one of the greatest invention of mankind. But do you know that there are more people in the world who die because of, of inappropriate medications than in road accidents, five times more? That's just unacceptable for us. Uh, of course, the, the impact, the financial impact, the financial impact is, is 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 huge for the ecosystem and also for pharma companies. When you consider that that one drug uh, costs more than two billion uh, euros uh, to be developed. So uh, our bet is that medication should deserve a perfect fit the right treatment to the right patient at the right dose and at the right moment. And to do that, we gathered a team of 18 people um, with a scientific DNA. I am myself a former teacher in pharmacology. And we elaborated uh, a digital twin of a patient based on personal characteristics, literature data, clinical data, and regulatory data. Uh, we're going to dig into it and see what is under the hood. The digital twin is can be is elaborated in two different steps. The first one is a quite classical artificial intelligence approach. We are uh, diving, we are browsing the literature and, and heterogeneous sources, public and private sources, to um, understand pharmacology. So this algorithm is reading for articles, uh, pharmacology, and is able to say, okay, if you're interested in two Paracetamol, I find that there is an article describing the impact of weight on paracetamol. And I find another article describing the influence of age on paracetamol. Then at step two, we uh, integrate, we compose all this information in one meta model. This is called a pharmacokinetic meta model for the ones that are in the field. I'm a former teacher, more precisely, in pharmacokinetics. Uh, so this model is a meta model composed of the, by the aggregation of all those individual data. So potentially it can simulate medications based on um, an infinity of parameters like gender, height, weight, renal status, diet, genetics, and so on. So, but from a practical point of view, it's very simple. This is what you see here. This is a screenshot from uh, our device dedicated to healthcare professionals. Uh, you see, this is our digital twin. This is not a 3D twin. This is pharmacology. So this is the blood concentration of a drug uh, during one week. Each peak that you see here is a, is a drug intake. This drug is called Pradaxa. This is an anticoagulant at 150 milligrams, twice a day, 8 a.m., 8 p.m. So each peak is a drug intake. It goes up and down. And you see that after uh, a few days, after one week, you see those peaks accumulate uh, above this red threshold. It means that uh, this uh, patient have, has a risk of over, um, overdose. This patient is a, is a woman, 28 years old, 45 kilos, so she's quite skinny, with a severe renal impairment. And that's because of this renal impairment that she accumulates uh, medication uh, in her body. So for this girl, uh, a more appropriate dose would be not 150, but 110 milligrams of the same medication twice a day. In that case, you see that she remains in the therapeutic window between the green and the red threshold. So this is what we do. This is, the, the, this is how we save lives. Uh, this is what we call the Examed Healthcare Professional Portal. We also have a patient uh, application that is on the market. But we also provide the same service as a SaaS software as a service for uh, B2B clients. Uh, what I show, I'm showing you is more than six years of R&D, 5,000 medications that are simulated. We demonstrated that we are the most accurate uh, pharmacological modeling and simulation ever. We published it. Uh, we have now nine scientific publications. The last one was accepted just uh, in August. Um, proving that we are the, the best approach. And we are um, not only a device, but a medical device, a CMART medical device. We won all the prizes you can imagine. Uh, this is, I know this is a, a, a very competitive price in the, the French ecosystem um, for our ability to, to model and simulate multiple drug interactions. France 2030 is another uh, very famous grant in France. We, are, we have also grants in Europe and 
well, some recognition, of course. Um, my, my mother is very proud of this slide, but uh, not. Uh, but it's not only recognition; it's also money because this is grants, and we have still 2.5 million euros of grants uh, to be perceived in the in the next uh, three years. So our business is a B2B business. We have two types of clients. Our legacy business is typically what we call medical solution providers. This is the software as a service. Vidal is the French leader of uh, um, drug and medical information. We integrate our simulations into their own uh, platform uh, to secure uh, prescriptions. But this year, in 2024, we decided to emphasize the segment of pharmaceutical industry, which is a bit different. We don't simulate only one patient. We simulate a cohort now of patients. The goal is to anticipate the risk of a clinical study. You know, it's very important for pharmaceutical companies to know if they have to decrease the cost, the risk of those trial to increase the approval rates of a new medication. Uh, so this is... Uh, quick um, view of our legacy clients and our new prospects. And we, you see that we aim at increasing the, the pricing up to 1 million per year per patient, per, um, sorry, per client. So it's a bit particular because we're not just looking for fundraising. We are looking also interested into uh, an M&A, a merger of, uh, of our company. So I know it's a bit different of, uh, uh, from other companies, but this is our configuration right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. Very exciting technology. And now I'm looking forward to the questions and comments of the jury, um, if they are any. Um, John, Anna, Angelo, Guy, any comments from your side? I'll be starting, uh, Tomas. Hi, Frederick. Thanks for the for the presentation. I wanted to ask you if you are currently um, uh, selling the solution, uh, and you have what is your traction, please. Yes, yes. But well, first, I have to say a disclaimer. Um, we are part uh, of a mother company that is a listed company. So I'm sorry, but I don't have the right to, to, to give okay. the exact uh, amounts publicly. But of course, if we sign an NDA with an investor, there is no problem to show you uh, the, the detailed business plan. So yes, we are, we are making money. Uh, we, have, we have our legacy clients. That are the that are the one I described the medical solution providers uh, the, um, the medical devices operational and so the, we have two clients that are the first the French leaders uh, Vidal and uh, that just showed and CGDIM who is the that is their main competitor uh, they are the ones uh, providing information for physicians pharmacists in in France also have clients like Elsevier worldwide um, and pharma companies also already. What is the reason why are you selling? Uh, why are you looking for a for a trade sell? This is a good question. Uh, we had very bad news recently. Uh, we have to be clear. This is public information. Uh, our mother company. We were supposed to to merge with a mother company that that uh, acquired Exacure um, has declared the cessation of payment. So that's why now. Uh, Okay, we are interested into a fundraising, maybe to to counteract this uh, this um, financial um, issue, but uh, we also look for a merger and an acquisition. I see. Okay, thank you, Fred. I'm aware that it's not very classical. It was not the when we discussed uh, uh, a few a few months ago. It was not the case. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions or comments? All right. Yeah. All right. I, okay. Oh. Go ahead, John. We have time. I'm just out of curiosity with stuff like this. Compliance liability with health, it, it terrifies me, and certainly as an investor. Just curious, who takes on the liability when you're providing this information about how a drug's going to react with an individual? That seems like if it goes wrong, that could be a really big problem for someone in your in your chain there, whether it's you or the manufacturer or the prescribing physician? Yes, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, this question of responsibility uh, is, um, everything is included in, in the fact that we are a medical device. Uh, and we are already a CMR medical device, which means that we have claims. We don't claim to give the, the, the right posology. We claim to give you um, a state-of-the-art simulation of the the knowledge to date let's say uh in which means that your digital twin is not a, a real uh reflect of yourself this is a reflect of the state of uh, the state of the art 
So this is what we what we provide as a simulation, what we consider the the, the most precise uh, simulation of the patient. But we don't say this is true. We don't say this is a reality. And we don't say, we never say in the medical device, you should now take one pill at 50 milligrams. We say it's like a speedometer. It's not the same responsibility. We say if you take this pill with 50 milligrams, then it becomes orange and maybe uh, red for the patient. But uh, then you can do what you want. You take your responsibility as a prescriber. We don't say uh, you need to change the pathology. And from a legal point of view, that's why, uh, well, once again, it's like a, it's like a GPS or, or a speedometer. You, this, this is not a tool that will drive your car. This is just the, the driver is responsible for, uh, for driving the car. That's the same for prescribers. And the way that's set up, Frederick, does that does that translate to the best of your knowledge into other countries or jurisdictions, not just in Europe, but if you wanted to scale this internationally? Is that common acceptance across across most territories or regions? Uh, yeah, clearly. And the, the, our next target is clearly the U.S., clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the same type of regula- regulation, exactly the same type of regulation. Um, so we made a file and was accepted in, in Europe. And now the next step for us was to uh, also extend to other countries, clearly. And we had customers in the US. But it's interesting that we have some customers that are medical device type of customers, but we are also non-medical device type of customers. In that case, we don't have the same uh, legal constraints. Okay, very insightful. Yeah. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you. Move to the next presenter. Next joining us uh, will be Kaido from the company Mifsud. So Kaido Zar, the stage is yours. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Kaido, CEO of uh, Mifundo. Let me start with a simple question. Why can American citizen easily relocate from New York to California, buy a new house, ask for a mortgage without any problems and hassles? Why can't such a simple thing happen in Europe? Answer is not because US is a one single country. No, because of an integrated credit scoring system. Unfortunately, it does not exist in Europe. Our novel approach will disrupt the credit scoring industry in Europe. We can do it only because of our experience in the sector. I myself spent 15 years in building up a bank which operates in nine countries. And my colleague Keio, she was country manager of Spain in the same bank. Both of us, we saw there is a gap in the market. Problem is, the credit data is highly fragmented and badly managed in Europe. People might have brilliant credit history in their own country, but if they are moving to another country, they become nobody. Banks do not trust them anymore, including my teammate Keio, Estonian citizen living in Spain, came back to Estonia, wanted to buy a house, but got rejected by the banks due to lack of a day. As a breakthrough solution, never done before, Mifundo engine unifies data from different countries into one single half, standardizes it, analyzes it, and calculates PAN-EU credit score. With one click, consumers can share the data to the banks, and banks can grant the credit to the people they rejected before. As outcome, people can easily relocate and later to come back. Usually, they experience the problem twice. Same applies for people which are related to multiple countries. And it's possible to purchase the real estate property in another country. Banks can reduce the credit risk of their foreign customers up to seven times and raise the business volume by 15%. Banks total lending to private persons is 7.2 trillion euros in EU. And 45 million people are expats or related to multiple countries, comprising to 10% of the population. This means 720 billion euros. Banks pay based on the package either for each inquiry or or issued loan volumes. Service is free of charge for end customers. Mifundo has a potential for annual loan volume of 10 billion and revenue 370 million euros. Our closest competitors are local credit bureaus, which do not operate across borders. 
and American companies which do the same, but they are not present in Europe because of the complexity of this market. This is what we crack, building European-owned champion in this global industry. Why now? European Commission has approved EU digital finance in order to build one single market for financial services. Based on that, last year, EU introduced Open Data Act FIDA, EU AI Act, and Digital Identity Wallet. It's a window of opportunity right now. Supported by the regulations, demanded by the consumers, demanded by the banks, we will introduce the disruptive technology in Europe. As a legal proof, we obtained a license from Estonian Financial Supervision Authority, at first piloted with four banks and 10,000 consumers. Next, bigger scale banks are ready to start if we extend our coverage, data coverage. We have built relationship with 31 credit bureaus, eight of them are integrated now. Besides deep knowledge of banking, we have also experience from Estonian unicorns, Skype, Bolt, Bike Drive. Also, first version was introduced last year. We have already gained reputable awards in the industry. Until now, we have raised 2.3 million euros plus European Innovation Council has committed 8.8 .8 million euros. Join us in building a world where people have freedom to move, freedom to be trusted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaidu. Very interesting solution. And uh, I'm going to hand over to the jury, uh, Anna and the rest of the jury. Um, do you have any comments or questions uh, for Kaidu? Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. I have one question related to your go-to-market strategy. So do I understand it correctly that you're basically selling to banks and then banks use your solution in their interaction with their customers, right? So how does your yeah, kind of sales process look like um, selling to banks? Because I also know from our portfolio experience that this can be quite cumbersome uh, and lengthy. Yes, at first, that's correct. Uh, um, at first, we are selling to the banks uh, and getting the end customers through them. Later on, we can uh, end scale also end customers by ourselves. But, but at first, we are uh, based purely on the banks and their customers. And how do we approach to the banks? Uh, mainly, we are using uh, different kind of events, active participation in the events, and direct contacts uh, with them. And due to our own background, it's easier to uh, open the doors, and we have been capable to open the doors. Uh, we have currently uh, 40 plus uh, banks in our pi pipeline, and uh, many of them have already shared their customer insight from which countries, uh, how many customers are coming from. We have a knowledge, we have collected it. Um, and uh, in general, in this industry, sales cycles are long, but uh, banks are loyal. Once they are buying you, they are staying with you. And there is a first mover advantage in this industry. Whatever country they're looking, either Germany, either UK, US, uh, in credit scoring industry, there is always first mover advantage. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from the jury? Other questions? I know, thanks, that was great. Uh, you can probably tell by my accent that I'm not European. So I've been I've been wanting something like this for quite some time. Um, and I really like when you mentioned Equifax and I'm wondering like if it, Equifax scoring from Canada could be pulled in to a European lending bank to, to give a proper assessment of somebody's credit scoring. But um, I'd be curious to know what your thinking is with the, you know, the high adoption of digital banks like Revolut here in Ireland, they're soon or, or maybe they already are giving out loans, they're getting approval for mortgages. And because that's a European digital bank, they probably have their own credit scoring or the ability to pull different credit scores. And what I appreciate there is there is a need for this. I wonder with the high adoption of these non high street traditional banks um if you see that as a threat in say five or ten years from now uh, honestly we have uh, been in contact uh, both type of banks uh, old banks and also neo banks uh, like revolut and we know how do they think and also what kind of technology they have and even though 
for example, Revolut has started uh, issuing credit products in certain countries. What we are doing, we are still uh, doing the same what the old banks are doing. We are doing regular local customer in that specific country, doing same uh, background check, same analysis, and pro providing you credit. But if a person is uh, related to multiple countries or relocating from one country to another, it's not the part of their scope as well, because it's much more complex than uh, regular local customers. So uh, Revolut and other neobanks, they are brilliant customers for us as well. I didn't mention anyone in the presentation, mm. uh, but I can ensure you that we have such kind of banks in our pipeline as well, and we are in active context. Okay, thank you so much, Kairu. And we're halfway through here. Um, three more pitches uh, that are going to follow now. And next in line is Christoph Neumauer, Neumeyer from Perian. So Christoph, uh, the stage is yours. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Perfect. Let's get started. As I said, I'm Christoph. I'm honored to tell you about Perian and how we are going to be Europe's first cloud hyperscaler. But let's kick it off with a short and easy question. We ask every customer and company we have talked to in the last three years, how many cloud providers do you know? Um, if you're like me three years before, or most companies we talk to, you know the three big American cloud providers, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. But I can assure you, there are so many more. Cheap ones, um, expensive ones, modern ones, kind of old ones, um, globally acting cloud providers, or ones specific to Europe, or even the city that you live in. But the question is, which of those is the cheapest? Which of those has the certification that I as a company need when I'm working in medical? Who is GDPR compliant? Which data centers are uh, energy efficient and using green energy? The cloud market in general is super complex, uh, complex and intransparent, at least until we as Perian came along. We are now using the publicly available interfaces those cloud providers expose and abstract them onto one unified interface. That not only, not only makes it easy to use all of them in the same manner, but also gives company first-hand insights, which of those cloud providers and which services on them are perfect for me and my use case as a company. The concept of that abstraction is called sky computing. And we as Perian are the world's first sky provider. As you might imagine, it's not so easy to do that for all cloud providers out there, not all of the services that they provide. So we, as first, um, start off with the AI use case, and more specifically, with the training of AI models. Our product is a platform that companies can use to train their AI models on top of the cloud providers that we support. It gives the companies, for the first time, the ability to define the requirements not only for the AI workload, but also for the cloud provider. Like where the location of the data center will be, if it needs to be GDPR compliant or needs a specific certification. We automatically match all of those requirements with the cloud providers and the instances and resources that we have in our portfolio. Take care of all the infrastructure setup, billing and accounting, all of that has been pretty tedious in the past. And the companies and our customers have full control and visibility where everything is running. Our platform almost guarantees that a company has the perfect and best offer available on the market. As it is highly automatic and automated our platform, companies save a lot of time, time that they can now use to develop their products rather than managing their cloud provider. And as we can leverage all the price differences between the cloud providers beneath us, it makes it pretty easy for us to save our customers a lot of money. On average, we save 40% on their cloud expenses. In most cases, even much more than that. Our business model is pretty common how it is handled in the cloud market is a consumption-based business model. It means Every resource that our customers are consuming on the cloud providers beneath us, we add a fee of 7.5% on top of that. Additionally, from the cloud providers, we're getting on average 10% as a reseller commission. Our platform is currently in beta phase, and we have developed it with our set six paying uh, pilot customers for the last couple of months. I'm pretty happy to announce that we're going to be publicly available and launching next week. We currently support the four biggest European cloud providers, and including one um, big American hyperscaler. The benefits I told you about, like flexibility, um, expenses reduction, and time saving, all of that has been proven with our pilot customers. Our founding team 
consists of Omar Tarabai, myself, Anselm Josek, and Robin Strinsky. In combination, we have 20 years of experience in cloud and AI, working at companies like Google, AWS, and SAP. Not only experiencing the problems that companies have with the cloud, but also having the experience with companies that are offering cloud services. So we're perfectly equipped what we are aiming for. I hope I ignited your, your interest in Perian and the concept of sky computing. We're aiming to close our seed funding round of 5 million in February next year. And I'm happy for all your questions and insights you share. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christoph. Great pitch. And I'm going to hand it over to the jury panel. Are there any questions and comments for Christoph? We'll go first again, Tomas. Uh, Christoph, thanks again for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it's something not completely new for me. I want to share a couple of uh, contacts later on uh, with you that uh, of actually um, Scaleway and another company that does something similar. So I think it's worth it for you to, to have a look. But I wanted to ask you, um, could you please explain to us how the business model does work with the cloud providers? Mm -hmm. Give us some more detailed insight in that, please. Sure. Um, for our cloud providers, we are nothing else than a, another sales channel that is for free for them. We have the customers and bring them to their platform. Um, for that service, I would call, we're getting a commission that is averagely 10% differs on the size of cloud providers. Some give us less, some give us much more. On average, it's 10%. That's the commission we get from the cloud providers. And our customers are paying a platform fee to use the platform. So pretty easy. So it does mean that you take care of integration yourself. Correct. So you bar them. Normally, yeah. we, we contact them, say you have exactly the services that we want to offer to our customers. Um, the European ones are pretty eager to work with us for, because we're getting them customers they never had touched before. So they're super interested in what we're offering. And then we offer integration. All of their APIs are normally totally public. So we do all the integration effort on our own, which normally takes one to two months, and then we can go. Okay. And what has been the feedback from the cloud providers uh, in regards to the fact that clients that you originally bring on board, for example, mm -hmm. then may, may decide to swap for another provider. And okay. that's a little bit of a problem for them because they're tactic is to make that sticky so that they are completely adopted usually. So what was the feedback about that? A really good question. Um, the answer to that question needs to be differentiated between which cloud providers. Are you talking to the European cloud providers? They love us. Are you talking to the big hyperscalers? I talked um, to you at the start of the presentation. They don't really like us, which is totally fine. We are focusing on the cloud providers in Europe, bringing them customers from other cloud providers, mainly from the big hyperscalers. So we're opening up the market from hyperscalers to European cloud providers. So they love us. Um, hyperscalers not loving us is totally fine for us because we're based and focused on European market and therefore we work closely with those. Okay, fantastic. Anyway, I know the management at uh, Scaleway, the French Scaleway, and also awesome. Square from Switzerland. So I can make an intro later. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Is there any other question or comment from the jury? All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. One more. Um, mm -hmm. Just you mentioned you. Thank you. Uh, a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Thanks. You mentioned you were going to raise five million. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're going to do with that? Yeah. I think the only two parts we're really going to spend money on is development and sales. Um, development, I think, is pretty clear because what we're doing may seem easy from an outside perspective, but it is pretty complex. Interfaces the cloud providers expose, they change a lot. We're going to add more services to become the Sky platform that we want to envision at the end, which means um, servicing all the normal services that a cloud provider has is a lot of effort. So most of the money is going, around 50% is going to development. Around 30% of the money is going to sales because two things are important in development and selling the product. Um, we have a pretty good idea how we're doing it. Um, I'm not sure that I would say it's a perfect sales mechanism yet, but we're going to work on that. Um, we're working mainly with integration. So we're not trying to replace a cloud provider. We're going to be another additional layer in, in the cloud infrastructure of a company. And that's the way we're selling. And so development and sales, those are the biggest parts uh, money's going in. And of course, that's all on headcount. Yeah. So employees. Fair enough. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you so very much. much, Christoph. Good pitch. And we're going to move on to the next presenter. Next uh, joining us will be Miri from SciDot. So Miri Hataya, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good day. All right. Okay. Great to 
Great to meet you, everyone. Happy to introduce Sidot. Uh, we are a Finland-based uh, AI governance company. Uh, we're a group of uh, 19 persons, uh, leaders, uh, professionals uh, on a global, global scale in the um, area of AI governance, AI regulation, and AI safety. The problem that we are tackling with uh, is uh, what our customers are are uh, facing today, large enterprises, government organizations are asking themselves, how can we accelerate the AI speed to market while keeping AI in control? How do we manage the risks of AI and solve that bottleneck uh, that is uh, slowing down the adaptation of, of AI in organizations? How do we do that? Uh, we uh, provide a SaaS platform for AI governance. Our target group is really uh, AI product teams and AI business teams, uh, those who really have the uh, urge to take into use AI systems in their business processes, building those uh, systems that are struggling with this, uh, this challenge of unclarity regarding AI risks and, and regulations. Our platform really empowers these AI teams to take accountability and do high quality AI governance efficiently. How do we do that? Uh, the product consists of two main uh, parts. Uh, first, we have cited library. This is a knowledge base of everything uh, in AI governance that uh, people who do operational AI governance need to have at hand and understand. Uh, we are monitoring AI regulations, AI uh, policies uh, around the world, breaking those down into uh, understandable uh, structures and requirements that can be applied in a single uh, AI-based system. Uh, we look at the um, AI risks specifically, the ways how to mitigate this and, and serve uh, customers through the library uh, with risk information and uh, and, and um, fasten the, the, the way of identifying relevant risks for their systems. We also uh, look at models um, uh, and how do they perform and, and provide that through the library. The second part of the product is, uh, is uh, cited governance. That's the inventory tool that our clients use uh, to build their own AI inventory. They register uh, when they start to uh, develop or uh, procure deploy AI-based products, they register uh, those uh, systems in the CITES governance platform, their AI inventory, and take those uh, systems through uh, through everyday everyday governance on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the platform. Everything is empowered by CITES Graph, which is really the heart of the product. Uh, the information that is um, that is offered through the library, all the expert curated information, uh, is is stored on the knowledge graph. Um, and it's connected also to the client's inventory on the product. We also have the client's own uh, compliance-related information uh, stored in a way that helps them to reuse this information uh, in a new context, uh, taking uh, down the time spent on, on, on doing compliance-related work uh, radically. Here are just like you know, some screens. This is how does it look uh, for, the, for the customers. Our policy library covers AI laws, proposed laws, breaks those down into understandable uh, uh, ways so that uh, AI teams and deployers can understand what is required for them. Uh, we have risk register, uh, risks and mitigations, also uh, bringing incident data related to risks there. Model, um, uh, model um, uh, catalog library, related to pre-trained models that all of our customers use uh, uh, readily information about model cards, but also the evaluations, how do these uh, models perform? This is how the governance part looks. So the clients own AI systems in the inventory. Uh, this is, uh, they register it here, and then uh, um, uh, we start to recommend information that helps them uh, to, to take uh, forward their uh, governance more efficiently. For example, identify risks that are relevant typically for these kind of systems and what could be the good mitigations. They also do compliance. Uh, first of uh, August uh, this year, AI Act came in force. Uh, on our platform, we have 12 uh, different templates for customers with ready-made controls on, on AI Act compliance, providing the world's more, most uh, uh, tangible and granular level uh, capability to implement AI Act. We are selling in enterprises to AI leads or AI governance leads. Compliance and um, legal teams are always involved in this work, but uh, our uh, product is uh, a little bit different kind of GRC product targeting really to, uh, to non-traditional GRC, um, uh, uh, GRC uh, users across different industries with high AI maturity or high uh, risk. We are at the moment uh, focusing on Europe in go-to-market, but raising uh, our A round uh, next 
first half uh, next year and uh, targeting to US markets um, um, uh, with the help of that round. Here are our growth metrics. Um, uh, 170 plus beta users on the product, month-on-month uh, -month growth at the moment, 22%, uh, uh, and uh, MR um, around um, 40,000 euros. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Miri. Very inter interesting metrics and very uh, interesting and promising technology. So I'm going to hand it over to the jury again. Um, Anna, Angelo, John, and Guy, are there any questions from your side? Sure. Yes, maybe. Uh, John, do you Go ahead, Anna. Go ahead. Perfect. Thanks a lot for, for the presentation. I was just wondering, like, what's your experience from your customer interaction? Like, how much education is still needed on, on, on that topic? And how do you deem, like, the, the current state of that? Yeah, we are... We have all the time targeted on on making the product uh, really educational in a way that uh, that uh, serves serves this need, and it doesn't require a long uh, long integration or uh, implementation projects. So from that perspective, platform is really easy to use. However, we have noticed that it's very beneficial for both parties, both the client and ourselves, to really integrate the product into the environment by supporting them uh, through pilots on doing the first. Uh, first cases, registering them uh, on the product, and and there is a learning cur curve on AI governance on the client side that we can greatly help uh, by holding their hands on the first uh, first implementations or first projects. That's also an area where we collaborate with services partners and and see very synergistic uh, business model with them. Thank you. Um, are there any areas or or particular? companies profiles that seem to be more engaged with this product than others where you're seeing a greater uptick i find certainly enterprise space where everyone has interest in ai everyone's terrified of this eu ai act and the governance and compliance behind it mm -hmm. are there are you finding some industries or, or verticals more engaged in backing this or mm -hmm. finding that there might be some reluctance perhaps too early for them at this stage. Mm -hmm. We have seen a uh, shift change uh, uh, this autumn uh, as the AI Act is in force. Now, of course, there is, has been expectation and, and knowledge, uh, but now as it is in force, uh, 1st of August, so that has really moved the market very fast. So uh, practically uh, all large companies are, are working, especially on the Finance sector, telecommunications, media industries, all of them, uh, um, yeah, practically know that AI Act is coming and we need to do something. The transition periods are relatively short when it comes to prohibited systems. It's only six months. So that is ticking now, that timeline. So what uh, practically every large company using significant or like, you know, in scale AI in EU needs to do their inventory during uh, the next six months in order to uh, just make sure that they are not uh, using any prohibited systems. Uh, and then there is a little bit more time uh, on the high risk categories. But but really, this uh, train is moving right now. And that's, of course, why we are also also looking for uh, raising our next round because this market is uh, happening in a very analogical way as GDPR happened a few years ago and success stories like One Trust were built uh, in uh, in that way. So we really want to want to do the same for AI governance and be the category leader uh, in this wave. And with that in mind, are you familiar with diligence? Uh, we have come across that uh, with with that. Um, um, yeah, so so there are there are a lot of uh, um, players in uh, in these fields and emerging uh, players as well. In terms of competition, uh, we have uh, the strongest competition that we face uh, at the clients are the existing tools that the clients already or the organizations uh, enterprises already have. So we are discussing with clients if they could use uh, or enterprises are looking at uh, if we could use their privacy, existing privacy tools, but then eventually they will notice that uh, those are not serving them in this area in the best way, and they are looking for specialized tools. But that's really uh, the strongest competition that we see at the client discussions right now, and some uh, some um, um, uh, players from the same category, primarily from the US market. Yeah, I think there's a big opportunity for you if somehow when somebody's managing their AI compliance or looking at the governance, that there's some sort of summative profile of their business 
nearly that they could, particularly for regulated businesses, that they could input to their their board papers because yeah. as this act becomes more and more understood, and I'm sure it's going to have a little bit of gray area for the next year or two, like CSRD reporting and so forth. That summary, I think, will you'll find very valuable when pitching it to board level or certainly mm -hmm. the C-suite to say this can be in the board pack for those regulated businesses. But yeah, well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Very insightful. Thank you, Mehdi. And now we're coming to the final presenter of the day. Uh, joining us now will be Soren Kleberg from Southbeck. So Soren, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And we didn't do a dry run before, so uh, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So my name is Soren. I'm CEO of Selfback, and I'm going to present to you today Digital Therapeutics um, product. For those of you who don't know what it is, it is uh, something you should think of as basically a digital biotech company. Uh, but I'll come more into this when we speak about the business plan in a second. So we are basically in the business of transforming the usual care for back pain patients from what you see here as the small sticker note, which is a live example from a patient we obtained. And we're going to transfer that into the future of care with our AI-based self-back app. The problem we're addressing is something that's relevant for almost 600 million people worldwide, and that is back pain. It's the most frequent reason for disability uh, this is especially a problem when we're seeing the pension age slowly being extended upwards. So people need to stay healthy and, and need to have the uh, ability to work longer. Um, this gives a, a certain drive from uh, various uh, governments right now to try and, and do things that can actually extend the number of years that the citizens can work. And we are addressing the biggest cause of exit from the work workforce, which is uh, actually back pain. The um, good news is that we actually know what works against back pain, but so far the limitations in tools and resources in the healthcare system have actually prevented this from being offered to the patient. And that is what we are gonna do with our AI-based solution, we're gonna offer personalized multimodal back pain self-management um, in full accordance with clinical guidelines so that every single patient uh, get exactly what they need to suit their uh, abilities and requirements so that they can get rid of their back pain and come back again to enjoy life, the work and stay healthy. When I said multimodal, um, it's actually just with a comment here to say that it's not just exercises, it's also cognitive behavioral therapy and also motivation and support to stay compliant. The business model, and I promised to get back to that, was, as I mentioned, a digital therapeutic business model. This is quite similar to what you know from the pharmaceutical industry. That's why I mentioned you could think of us as a digital biotech. So what we're uh, bringing to the market is actually going to be prescribed by a doctor to the patient, and it's going to be paid for by the health insurance, either being it private or public, depending on which country you're in. There are established uh, price levels in France and Germany so far. Belgium is uh, still undecided on what level they're going to reimburse this kind of digital prescription dip therapeutics, but as you can see, it's quite a different price level than what we would be able to obtain in a regular app store scenario. The market for digital therapeutics is estimated to be uh, quite large in, in the coming years, but not all countries are regulatory prepared for it. You see which ones are regulatory ready here, and these are the markets that we are actively uh, pursuing right now. The key to unlocking these markets is actually to have evidence, and we have clinical evidence through a large-scale randomized controlled trial. And besides that, we are certified with all the certifications that are obtainable here in Europe. And we've recently been evaluated by National Institute of Health and Care Excellent, NICE, in, uh, in England. They did a survey to find all the digital therapeutics on the market for back pain. 
they evaluated them against each other and we came out on top of the list. So we are actually able to say that according to NICE, we have the highest quality clinical evidence app on the market today. And it means that we also cleared for our clinical use in the NHS. And that's one of the market um, that we actually entered first uh, back in 2022. And on the, on the background of this, we are now uh, pursuing more markets in Europe, the ones I showed you a moment ago that are regulatory enabled. And we are constantly monitoring for new regulation to go online and we will address additional markets as soon as they get uh, ready to reimburse uh, products like ours. So bringing this to the market is uh, basically uh, this core team, but we are 12 people in total sitting, sitting in Denmark, uh, in the city of Odens, right, right next to the um, University of Southern Denmark, where some of the world leading back pain experts are residing. Um, and what we are basically uh, asking uh, her currently is uh, for actually our first financing round, you can call it seed, but actually I wouldn't classify ourselves as a, as a typical seed state company because as you saw on the timeline, we've been active for quite a while, bootstrapped, but we are currently in the first financing round uh, looking to raise uh, two to three million euros. And these funds are going to be used for additional growth. So basically supporting the uh, go-to-market activities in the before mentioned markets, France, Belgium and UK primarily. Um, and yeah, this basically brings me to the end uh, of my presentation. So yeah, ready to... Thank you so much, Thorin. Okay. It's a very big market and an interesting solution. And I'm curious to hear the thoughts and comments of the jury members. So mm -hmm. who would like to go first? John? Um, I guess I'll go first. Yeah. Thanks, Thorin. I think, uh, I think the back pain is absolutely a problem that we're solving that everyone suffers. I had a lumbar discoplasty years ago, um, which at such a young age at the time was unheard of, but terrible back pain. Um, so it's great to see this, but I'm curious when I see these well-being and, and health apps, B2C is tough, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, I'd be curious as to what the pricing strategy is, what you're looking at with customer acquisition costs, and then also what two more things, what your product roadmap looks like, because you, you put out your revenue projections for the next two years or year and a half. I'm just curious. I'd imagine that your two to 3 million raise would go a lot towards the marketing and acquisition. So what does the product roadmap look like insofar as, once somebody uses your app, I don't think they're ever going to get rid of back pain. I think it's more about managing it properly. But how do you keep people engaged once they learn certain exercises and so forth? Is there a gamification to it? Is it just, I feel better afterwards? How does that work? Yeah, a lot of questions at once, but let me see if I could try and answer them all. <laughs> So basically our revenue projections and, and our ide uh, ideas of the pricing level are somewhat determined also by law. Uh, for example, in France, this is, uh, this is something that's determined by law. So it's, it's the exact amount of 435 euros for a three months license, and that's non-negotiable with the French authorities. Um, so in, in these countries where we know uh, that there's a law that regulates this, it's quite, um, it's quite uh, fixed what, we, what our expectations are. The customer acquisition is going to be through um, basically the healthcare providers. And what we've done, for example, in France, is to sign a five-year strategic uh, partnership with Ramsey Santé, which is the largest French healthcare provider. So we're going to basically be distributing through their 6,500 doctors self back to the French population. Um, as you rightly mentioned, people will learn to self-manage and actually, so it's not our, we're not a classical SAS model in the way we try to keep people in our app forever, but we, we do intend to keep them long enough that they learn the self-management skills that they need. Um, so, so don't think of us please as classical SAS model, but actually more um, uh, that it's actually okay that people will disengage from self-back at some point again. Did, did that answer your questions? Yeah, it, it did. Um, but based that it's it's sort of quarterly payments here, is that when you expect 
the term of engagement for somebody before they they go off on their own and not use the app anymore? Is that but again the three months period is something the French government decided in this case uh, that this is the standard way of uh, of pricing. Uh, yeah. What it means is that the patient will will need to revisit a doctor potentially at three months and then get a renewal of the prescription. Um, so so it's, it's basically again much similar to what you know from the pharmaceutical. Uh, business model that you that you get a prescription, you basically take your pills, and if you need more, you go back to the doctor and get a new prescription. Sure. And then, what about the as I was asking the 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 roadmap of the product? What does that look like? Yeah, good that you remind me of this. So basically, first we started with back pain because that is the largest patient group in the musculoskeletal area. We're gonna expand our product with neck as the next because it's the second largest uh, patient group. And then we continue from there down to different other body parts, that, but there will be less and less uh, patients in those. And then, you know, in the, in the very long perspective, you can imagine that this um, AI driven platform that we have can actually be used for self-management of other conditions that are not related to the musculoskeletal field, but uh, it, it could be then, um, moved into other therapeutic areas. Okay. Is there any final question for Søren from the jury? All right. Well done, Søren. Um, very insightful pitch. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. Uh, I think we saw some very interesting presentations. Uh, if every, anyone from the listeners uh, or viewers would like to get in touch with the startups or investors that presented today, please um, contact them directly or just shoot an email to thomas at eustartups.com and I will be happy to make a personal introduction. So um, before we mm, kick off and uh, start into the weekend, I want to remind our listeners to check out the platform uh, discover.dealflow.eu and to um, type in your profile there and present your company. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating and have a nice weekend.